Miguel for coming. Usually I I start and and sort of play Pink Floyd for about ten minutes before the the talk starts. But I, I don't I don't have speakers here, so you just got a little bit of it today. Um, yeah, so I'd like to talk about Pink Floyd today. Uh, no, I, I would like to talk about this uh, sort of distributed systems foundations in a bit. Um, so, just I will start with a disclaimer. So a career in distributed systems is both exhilarating and frustrating. When things work, it's like a symphony. When they don't, it's like an 11th birthday party where half of the kids are on speed. Uh, which is something that um, Jeff Darcy, who, is, who has been uh, creating um, HKFS or CloudFS, said about uh, distributed systems. And that's sort of been my experience as well over the past years. Um, it's kind of challenging. Um, a few words about myself. My name is Manuel Bernhard. I live in Vienna in Austria, but I'm actually kind of a mix between French and German. And I studied across over there at the INSA. So the campus just next door. So I quite know the place here a bit. Uh, what I do professionally, I work as an independent consultant. I'm helping companies to um, get started with distributed and interactive systems or to keep them running. So my clients either call me before they um, start with the journey and, and want some assistance. That's sort of the, the one scenario. The other scenario is just they call me when things are on fire and everything is on fire. And then I just go in and try to make things a bit less... Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm a Lightband consulting and training partner, and my focus is mainly on ACA streams, ACA cluster, and yeah, really, really much the, the clustering part, so everything distributed. I'm also a scuba diver. Um, this is not the Danube in Austria, I wish. Um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's start with a bit of a motivational quote Life is a single player game. You're born alone. You're going to die alone. All of your interpretations are alone. All your memories are alone. You're gone in three generations and no one cares. Before you showed up, nobody cared. It's all single player. Beautiful quote by uh, Naval Ravikant. Are you uh, motivated yet? No? <laughs> Did that work? Am I good at this? Any? No. Um, no, I'm really, this quote is more to motivate my talk than to motivate you, also if you are motivated and feel the urge to live your life to the fullest, then even the better. Um, th the reason why I bring this quote on is um, this is a cluster. Okay, these are Raspberry Pis. Maybe you recognize the logos there. You know, it's um, this is and this is sort of how we see clusters uh, in general. We have this view, this top-down view, where we see all of the nodes in the cluster. Now, the reality of it is that this is an illusion, this sort of God view of, of knowing everyone who is there. It doesn't exist because at the end of the day, what we do is we write software and the software runs on a particular machine. And so what we see from the vintage point of the computer of the machine is other nodes. So I just place the camera, uh, you know, on, on this on this guy here. And then that's what you see. You see the other nodes. Or you don't see them because, who knows, maybe the network is partitioned or maybe the process that you want to talk to on the other node is gone or maybe the entire machine is gone in flames. You don't know. It's just not there. And so that's pretty much what I want to cover in this talk. How do we build clusters? So we need three things to build clusters. We need um, to discover who is there with us in, in, the, in the cluster. Um, we need to figure out when things go wrong, when a node crashes. It's called discovery, uh, fault detection. And then finally, one of the reasons, not, not, it's not the only one, but one of the key reasons why we do things on several computers instead of just one, is because we need more power, because we can't scale vertically anymore, so we scale ver horizontally. The other thing is uh, failure fault uh, tolerance, but one thing is load balancing, and so does that's a key point when you want to build clusters. So and if, we, if we sort of think, how can we abstract all of these things, one abstraction that works really well is the one of group membership. A service that provides group membership, tells it, telling you who is there, who is not there, that's exactly what you need. Um, so how do we implement group membership? Again, we need three things. 
we need failure detectors, figuring out uh, which nodes have crashed or uh, have not crashed. We need dissemination, we need a way to pass the word around in our cluster to spread information about. And the third thing is we need to reach consensus on who is there with us in our cluster, who are the members. Um, and so let's start with this. Who can tell me which album this is? Sorry? Wish You Were Here, yes. That's uh, Wish You Were Here. Um, failure detection, I'm going to start with this topic here. For some reason, I have an irrational uh, appetite for failure detectors and sort of failure detection algorithms. I don't know where that comes from. Um, so let get, let's get get started with some a bit of theory, a bit of, of fundamentals. So if we when we talk about failure detectors, we there is two key properties that we talk about. Um, the first one is completeness, which is to say that we want to make sure that if a process crashes, all the other processes know that this process has crashed. So we don't want anyone to not know that the process is gone. Um, I say process, but I use it interchangeably with uh, membership, in member in, in, in the nodes, in the set of, uh, of uh, members of the cluster, right? So, um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing and the second property we're interested about when we characterize failure detectors is the accuracy. And accuracy is about f um, f uh, false positives. So if we have healthy nodes, we don't want our healthy nodes to start suspecting other healthy nodes of having crashed when in fact they are fine. Okay, so we don't want this, uh, this sort of thing where this guy is gone but in fact he's not. So th this, is, this is bad, this is not very stable. Um, there is also a few other pesky little things that we need to care about in practice when we want to do this in reality. We need to care about the speed of failure detection. I mean, if the algorithm takes 10 minutes to detect a failure, then you know maybe by that time your users are gone for, for a long time already. And then the other thing is network message load. How, how many messages do I need? How much bytes do I need to shove down the wires to make sure that I know when something has, has gone wrong. Um, so these are the two things here. Um, now, the thing that, that is quite frustrating in distributed systems engineering is that many things are impossible. So for example, one impossibility result is that it is impossible for a failure detector algorithm to deterministically achieve both completeness and accuracy the two key things I just talked about before, over an asynchronous and reliable network. The bad news for us is that we only have asynchronous and reliable networks, okay? So by definition, these two things that we wanted to have, well, we can't get them. We can't get them at the same time. It's not possible. That's proven. There is a paper about it um, based on a, on a set of other papers, but basically this is something we know is not possible. Uh, so what do we do? What do we, what do we do? Well, we have to make trade-offs. That's what we do when we build distributed systems. We make trade-offs. We talk about strong to weak completeness, meaning that either all or some non-faulty members are detecting a crash, and we talk to strong to weak accuracy, which is to say that there is no false positives or some false positives. So these are the trade-offs we can make when we talk about failure detectors. Uh, in practice, most applications will go for strong <coughs> completeness and a weaker form of accuracy. Because it's, it's, it's really tricky to sort of get a, have a stable system if, you, if not everyone knows that there is a failure. So it's better, uh, you're better off when sometimes you have a false positive and, and things go up and down for a bit, but they stabilize eventually. So there is uh, one form of uh, strong eventual um, accuracy is one, one form, one classification of accuracy. There's like tons of, there's a whole spectrum of classifications, but most applications want strong completeness and a uh, weaker form of accuracy. That works well together. Okay, so that was the theory bit. Let's talk a little bit now about um, real-life 
failure detectors. No, no, sorry, just one more bit of theory. Um, there's two ways in which you can perform a failure detection. The first one is a heartbeat. So the one node will ping, uh, just send a message to the other node saying, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. And then when this node stops receiving something, they cannot start to assume that the other one is not alive anymore. That's one strategy. The other strategy is just a ping pong is saying like, hey, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Are you here? Yes, I'm here, etc. So on, so on, so on. These are two, two ways in which you can achieve that. Pretty simple, but um, yeah. Okay, let's start with real life uh, failure detectors. So the first one I want to talk about is the fee adaptive accrual failure detector, which has an insanely cool name. And this is why everyone is using it. I really think that's the only <laughs> reason. No. Uh, the, 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 this was made popular by um, Facebook because they had their Cassandra clusters and they started having larger and larger Cassandra clusters. And when they, re when they cross crossed like about 100 nodes, now they have much bigger ones. But when, they, when it started to grow too large, too much, then um, the sort of deadline-based failure detectors they had didn't work very well anymore, didn't scale. So what does uh, this uh, accrual failure detector do? Well, the first thing, it's adaptive. Adaptive means it's adapting to changing network conditions. So it's not because suddenly you have a congestion that the failure detector will go like, whoa, what's going on? Everything is down. No, it's, it's kind of stable in the, the sense that it, it, can, it can cope with these changes in, in network quality. But what this failure detector introduced was the notion of accrual failure detection. What does that mean? Well, the failure detectors before that, it was either black or white, either the, the node is gone or the node is there. I can not trust them or I can trust them. There is only these two values. What a, an accrual failure detector does is that instead of giving you a, a binary value, it gives you a suspicion value, sort of a probability saying, hey, I kind of think this guy is in, is in trouble, 0 0.8, you know, or it, no, it is probably fine, 0 0.2. So this is a f it's a probability or a suspicion value that says, look, um, this is a spectrum and this is how, how this process is doing on, on the spectrum. Because um, there is no certainty in, in that sense in networks. We, we can't be quite sure. Um, now, for example, you would have a master node and some worker pro nodes. And um, wha what you could say is if the suspicion value crosses a threshold of 8, we stop sending new work to the node. If it's crossing 10, then we, st we know there's something really wrong. We start rebalancing the current tasks of that worker to other nodes. And when it's over 12, we just sort of kick them off the membership ring because we know they're doomed. Um, now, what I want to show you a bit is, is this. So this is the threshold, the, the, the fee threshold. If you look, the smaller the threshold, the, f the f uh, lower the detection time. Okay, so here I'm at six, I'm like at uh, less than a half a second of detection time. Now conversely, unfortunately as well, the lower the threshold, the higher the mistake rate. So this uh, accuracy that I was talking about before, well, the lower you are with the threshold, the, higher, the lower your accuracy is, the, the higher amount of false positives are you going to get on, on your failure detector. Um, and so there is a sweet spot somewhere between eight and 12 here. So if you look at that, that's also not too bad in sort of terms of detection time. What's really important is if you have a system that uses the fee accrual failure detector, um, know your network, okay? If you're on AWS with Amazon, you want to be at, you want to set fee to 12 or you want to set the, the, the threshold at 12 or more because you have a, a bad network, should I say. I mean, compared to a real live wire network where you can go down to six or less, depending on what you have. So that's one thing to know and to think about when, you work, when you're tuning these systems. All right, another failure detector. It's called the new adaptive accrual failure detector. Not as cool as of a name, but it has new in the name. So it's, uh, you know, it's gotta be good. Uh, <laughs> well, if you look at this graph, what it basically shows you here, it, it compares a lot of failure detectors. And what you see is it's much faster here. And uh, what's also nice is it's much simpler to implement than fee. So fee, you have to do a lot of calculations, which can be expensive if you're running on like um, hardware that's not very powerful. 
the fee is sort of really really simple and it's sort of more ad more adaptive in one way I, I ran this for uh, a few weeks on EC2 and it copes better with changing network conditions uh, yeah I, I, I did play with this two years ago I implemented it for Aka cluster and it performs slightly better than fee it's not not much <coughs> but a bit and it's still you know it's still um, a cruel failure detection so there's nothing new there if we want to talk about something new, we have to look at SWIM. So SWIM um, has this thing, as, is, as you swim lazily through the milieu, the secrets of the world will infect you. And that's one of these rare computer science papers that cites biology papers, um, which is quite interesting, uh, from uh, infectious diseases and how diseases spread in populations and so on. So it, it sort of references that, and that's sort of one of the core ideas of SWIM, is to spread knowledge through infection. I'm not going to cover this in this part. SWIM has two parts to it. It has a failure detection part, and it has a dissemination protocol. And here I'm going just to cover the failure detector part. Um, the design goal of SWIM was to be scalable. I think that's what the S stands for in SWIM. It's to be scalable uh, and not to have a linear penalty when you have more nodes in your membership group. Okay. Um, so the way it achieves that in terms of failure detection is by first, when a node is, uh, is in trouble, it first suspects it and doesn't quite kick it out right away. Okay. It gives the guy a chance. It says, okay, you, you're in trouble, but I'll figure it out. Um, so one thing it does, for example, is um, this is sort of how the how this uh, how the process goes, and also here you will see all the messages of the protocol. The first message is ping, you know, pick one node at random in, in the ring, and and ping them. Then let's say the other process uh, wants to reply, but is too slow, or it's a Java process and it's running a garbage collection. So you know the guy is is sort of uh, yeah, just very slow, uh, which happens in a lot of data intensive uh, <laughs> systems if you come to think of it. I see that a lot. It's just like, yeah, we have so much data, we allocate so much memory, and then sometimes, <laughs> and then two <laughs> seconds later it starts again, but the failure detector uh, thinks something is wrong. Now, for whatever reason, here our ACK is lost. So then this node that did send the initial ping, it doesn't panic, it sends ping request messages, ping rec to other three other nodes at random, so the fan out is sort of configurable in the protocol. And these other nodes, then in turn, they will ping this, uh, this node that is suspected of being in trouble. And then eventually, maybe one will get a reply. So that's a successful acknowledgement. And then that reply will be forwarded to the initial requester, which then will not st start suspecting it. If it did still suspect it, what it would start to do is start gossiping to everyone saying, hey, this node is gone, you know. And then there's another mechanism, which is that if you are a node and you receive a gossip about yourself being unavailable, you know, it's like, no, I'm here. So you start talking and you start sending to everyone very fast. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. Don't kick me out. So this is also <laughs> something that Swim does, which, um, which is quite nice. And it really helps to reduce the amount of false positives. That's the single largest problem when you scale up is... You get so many false positives. Everybody thinks that everyone else is gone, and it's not, not true. It's, it's just everyone is still there. It's just they can't see each other. Um, okay, but SWIM itself, which is, I think the paper is from 2002, if I'm not mistaken. Let me check. Uh, 2002, yes. Um, and if we compare that to our <coughs> to, to, to modern sort of data centers and loads, it's already outdated. The protocol already doesn't scale anymore. There's still too many false positives. This is where lifeguard comes in. Notice the name play, swim, lifeguard, you know. Um, so HashiCorp, you may have heard of them. They do things like Terraform, Console, um, Vault, etc. They do all of these uh, DevOps sort of low-level uh, tools for uh, managing your infrastructures. And they implemented, they took swim, figured it's not good enough, and they added something on top of it. So this is Lifeguard. It's an extension to Swim, a few modifications. It's implemented, the implementation of this uh, membership uh, service is called Member List, and it's implemented, it's open source, it's available, it's written in Go, because everything with ops is written in Go these days. Um, 
And um, what they managed to do is that when you switch on all of their extensions here, the, they have this L0 is the baseline, you see here these are the false positive events, and, um, and, and, and if you switch on all the extensions, they get then to less than 2% of false positive events. Less than 2%, so that's really an improvement. The only thing they do is, I think, if with L2 or one of them, drastically increases the amount of messages on a network, but apparently that's not a problem anymore because modern networks can handle that sort of traffic. That's the only criticism I would have, but it's pretty cool. I mean, come on, less than 2% of the failure rate than the than, than vanilla swim. It's, it's pretty good. I haven't heard of any failure detection sort of protocol that uh, is is better than this. I think this is the state of the art. I would be happy to learn about something that is even more evolved than this one, even more refined, but I think that HashiCorp really um, has, a, has a quite nice approach here. So if you're running console or any of these tools, you know that they, they, have, um, they have done a good job. All right, <coughs> let's talk about something else. What is this album? I'm not going to continue to talk unless someone can. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? No. Pulse, yes, Pulse. Um, and uh, this is the album Pulse I, I took for the second thing, which is about disseminating information, spreading information across your cluster. So <coughs> how do we communicate changes in the cluster in terms of membership, members joining, members leaving, members failing? How do we even spread that knowledge, especially if our cluster is big? thousands of nodes. I've run a cluster of 2,400, 2,600 nodes on EC2. Uh, it's challenging. How do you get this information across? Well, there's a few strategies that we could use. First that comes to mind is multicast. Now there is a bit of a issue here. Is Camille Fournier who said, um, just saw the phrase multicast support and a chill went down my spine. And and to be more to the point here, the almost uniform inability to support multicast on today's networks is such a humiliating defeat for distributed systems. I just had this discussion today at Uber. So we basically completely screwed up here. Uh, I studied telecommunications. All of the technology was invented before I studied, so I don't feel that responsible, but a bit we could have maybe improved on that. Multicast is a disaster. Um, there is hardware multicast, there is IP multicast, there is UDP multicast. But if you go in your data center to the people that uh, operate the service and you tell them, I, I want, can you uh, turn on UDP multicast for me? They go like, no, <laughs> sorry, are you crazy? <laughs> are you kidding me? Um, this is not something that, that people want, like, um, that goes on very well. Uh, quite a few technologies use, um, I, I forgot the name now, but, but quite a few cluster technologies use multicast, UDP multicast to do the initial discovery, except that very few companies want to turn it on. Um, now, multicast is, is, so it's not really an option, but even if we had multicast and if we care about order, total order, it's quite challenging. There's a 50 page report from Xavier Defago al on total order broadcast and multicast algorithms, which does a survey sort of, of all these issues that you run into when you're sort of broadcasting things uh, and then you want to maintain order in some way or form. It's also not that simple. Um, yeah, so we don't have multicast, so what do we do? Anyone remember these guys? Who did totally legally download uh, <laughs> things? In yeah? No? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> uh, this is Napster, pair-to-pair and peer-to-peer uh, -peer and, and so the idea was, well, we have the internet, how do we share files? Well, we, we're going to create this fake over the network just by talking to one, to si singular nodes, and then we form a ring, and then we can put an overlay network on top of the ring. These were short cord and all these other things uh, are, are based on that. And um, this is how we did it, huh? to these distributed searches on, on pair to pair networks. And um, so there is a few style gossip styles here that has be have been developed over the years. So one of them is random gossip. So one node picks another node at random at each protocol period. So let's say every second. 
And then on the second period, you see already it's two node gossiping and the third one for a five cluster node, we're good, we covered everything. So within three seconds or three protocol periods, we already have spread out the information everywhere. That's just by virtue of picking one single node at random at every tick. One node picks one other node, sends one other node uh, gossip message at, uh, at every tick. That's it. Um, there are more advanced and more deterministic ways. So round robin, for example, which will well do the round robin kind of thing and each round will go there. Uh, not that fast, so there is binary round robin, which goes like that. And um, if, if we want to be even more deterministic, we have this guy, round robin with sequence check, which additionally adds a, 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 an identifier and can predict when someone did not gossip, then it means that they're in trouble. So it also sort of adds a failure detection component to that. Um, and then another style, which is quite nice, is what SWIM does. So this um, infection style gossip. So instead of having dedicated gossip messages, what it does is it piggybacks on existing messages. So um, this ping ag or ping rec, these are messages, but you still have a bit of, of space because it's just ping, it's just nothing. So there is still some space on the frame that you're sending this on. So you basically take a part of the gossip and piggyback on these other, on these other messages. And sort of that way you sort of infect everyone, the whole network, with your gossip. Uh, without sending additional information, which was one of the more elegant solutions, I thought, of SWIM. Turns out that LifeGuard then said, oh, that doesn't really kind of work, so they added back <laughs> uh, <laughs> random gossip. Um, but um, the thing is, even though there are better ways and more deterministic ways, most technologies these days, they still resort to random gossip. So the simplest thing here, like this random gossip. I don't know why that is. Uh, I don't know if that is because in practice it's not so, so, so easy to, to get to work or because like this idea didn't percolate into the industry yet. I don't know. So these are three gossip styles. Um, but what is it that we even gossip about? What is it that we want to pass on. So let's take one of the earlier papers and w so what we have is a node A and A maintains a table of other nodes it knows about and when it has last seen them. So A has seen A zero seconds ago, A has seen B one second ago and A has seen C three seconds ago. Now if you look at B, B has seen A three seconds ago, it has seen B zero seconds ago because it's B and then it has seen C one second ago. Now if A and B are to exchange these tables via gossip, so A sends a gossip to B which replies with its own version of the truth, if you had add these tables, what you end up is this table where A and B have seen each other zero seconds ago and have seen C one second ago. And this is a, uh, an easy way to get um, gossip based uh, failure detection. And the, the thing is you can say I set a threshold of five five seconds, for example, and if any value in the table after merging has reached five, uh, I know the, the node is probably in trouble or, you know, I'm, and I don't need to communicate about this because I, I, I do random gossip anyway, so I'm always gossiping, and so I don't even need to say anything, it's implicit, everybody knows that C, C is, uh, has reached a threshold of five, so it probably can be removed from the membership ring. <coughs> so yeah, that's sort of what you gossip about. Um, there is quite a few optimizations that can be done. I picked a few here, but there is like a whole bunch of things. It's quite interesting. So Akka cluster, for example, will gossip with a higher probability to nodes that have not already seen a gossip. So the interesting thing about Akka cluster's gossip is it maintains a list of which version of the gossip each member has seen. So, or sorry, uh, which nodes have seen this version of the gossip? It maintains that list. So it sort of knows more or less who has seen a certain version of the gossip, and then it can say, "I'm not gonna send when I do the when I pick one node at random to talk to. I'm not gonna pick one of these. They already know this version, so I'm just gonna pick someone else." Uh, probability of 80% to one of these nodes when the no when the cluster is smaller than 400 nodes and above 400 nodes, it goes down to 60%. But you can configure this. Uh, because, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, at scale, the same rules don't quite apply. Also, like a cluster, 
when half of the members have seen the latest version of the gossip, it starts getting faster. So this can happen either when you're starting up the cluster, you don't get, uh, you don't have, you haven't reached convergence yet, not everyone has seen the same version, or when there has been a network partition and things are out of sync, then Akka cluster sort of speeds up and instead of gossiping at one second per default interval, it will gossip one third of a second, so it will speed up the things to to reach convergence faster, and then it slows down again. In LifeGuard, what they do is they have an anti-entropy mechanism, because by default what they do is they gossip around um, with UDP, which is unreliable and that introduces entropy. So what they do is, as a countermeasure, is um, one node every now and then will pick another node at random and do a full TCP sync of the membership information. And then these two guys are again aligned and that is deterministic because uh, we know it's TCP so it's got to be reliable, etc. All right. Next topic. Which album is this? This is a difficult one because it's actually not the front cover, it's, it's in the album art, so if you're not a hard copy. Oh. And that's a momentary lapse of reason, which goes with our topic of consensus. Um, so, here at this point in the talk I would like to quote Nietzsche. He who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. And if you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Which I find to be sort of fitting when you think and you go deep down into consensus protocols. Be careful. That's what I wanted to say here. Um, so, this is sort of a timeline of consensus protocols. 89 consensus Paxis, 2013 consensus Raft, and now we've reached the ultimate conclusion that uh, computers are terrible. Um, uh, I, I would I would like to say that maybe this is dark, but and there is a lot of interesting things going on in, in consensus research. Um, so let's let's start of going through this topic. So again, to repos repos why do we do this here is because we want to reach consensus as to who is a member of our cluster. This is why we want to do it. But in order to talk about consensus, I need to back down. And uh, go back a bit, little bit and, and, and sort of introduce the topic. Uh, and, and again, we start with saying that, okay, it's actually not uh, something that can be achieved. We have an impossibility result in, po the group ma in terms of group membership. So group membership with a single group, a primary partition, is impossible when there are nodes that are suspected of having failed. So the moment that you're suspecting one node in your cluster of having failed, you can't get consensus on a group anymore. For a long time, uh, the research community thought that that was possible, and in fact, it's not. It's um, it's proven to be. It's again a result derived by a former result called the FLP impossibility result. Is hey, everything is impossible? So, uh, <laughs> what does it mean for us? It means that if we are trying to form a cluster, and we uh, uh, the failure detector told us, look, one node is in trouble. At this point in time, when that is the state, it would be very unwise to make any membership decisions. So if a node wants to join or a node wants to leave at the time where the cluster is unstable or when, when one node is not reachable, that's a very bad idea. Because if you do that, then you're going to diverge. Okay? Then a part of the cluster will see one view of reality, the other part will see another view of reality, then you have schizophrenia and you, you can't agree anymore and then you, you're dead. It's, so don't take these, ma don't make these decisions. I will come back to that later. So how do we reach consensus? The first thing we want to, sort of the first uh, uh, seminal result on consensus is about time. You know, what's the time? That's, you know, um, you know, even if, if we back down and we go into, uh, into physics, there is no thing, like if, if I'm geographically distant, the time is already not the same because of relativity. But, um, yeah. So, who started this? Uh, Leslie Lampert started with Lampert clocks. And um, if there is one paper, if you're not so much into papers, but you're thinking, yeah, maybe I want to read a paper after this talk, read this one. Leslie Lampert's Time Clocks and the Ordering of Events in a Distributed System. This is a very important paper. It's very, very important, very interesting. Um, 
and it, it sort of tells you how do you order events in a distributed system. How can you establish an order between events? Now, after that, um, you can establish order with Lampert blocks, but you can't establish concurrency. You can't tell when things happen at the exact same time. So for this, you can use vector clocks, which is just vectors of Lampert clocks. And then you can tell when things happen at the same time. And to make things a little bit more confusing, there is also another bunch of people at more or less the same time develop version vectors. And then later on dotted version vectors, which are just version vectors which are a bit less fault, which don't has, uh, have as many fault, false positives. And they're very similar, so people mix them up a lot. But version vectors are primarily concerned with versioning, that's in the name versioning, so detecting conflicts in, in, in when data has changed whereas uh, vector clocks are about ordering, getting a total order of, of events in, in, um, uh, in distributed systems of a series of events. This is what, what these, these things are about. Now, just to show you that uh, I have at least one slide with code in it, uh, and to show you that um, I'm not, you know, this is not just great theory. This is ACA cluster's gossip message, and this here is a vector clock. So the version of the gossip is a vector clock, and that is used in ACA cluster to be able to, to tell when two nodes have conflicting views, so when, when the gossip happened, uh, when things changed at both ends, and when they need to merge their views of reality, is what ACA cluster uses there, a vector clock. Okay, <coughs> now let's talk about another very fundamental thing. Uh, replicated state machines. So uh, any sufficiently complicated model class contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-ridden, slow implementation of half a state machine. Very nice quote by Pete Ford. Who likes state machines? Yeah, a few people like state machines. The rest you build these things? No. Uh, <laughs> so state machines are really powerful things to, to sort of get state across. And replicated state machines is also Lampert um, sort of described the, the, the principle in the in time clocks and ordering of events. So let's say I have a client here and I want to send a value or a set of values to um, to a server, and I want this to be fault tolerant. I really want my data to be safe. So what do I do? I send this to one um, to one server, a series of events. It then replicates that to the other servers, which all of them apply these events in the same order. They, it can use as vector clocks, so then the order is known, to their state machines. Either these green things are the state machines. And if you apply the same events to the same state machines, then you, you end up with um, the same uh, state in, uh, in each machine. Turns out this is very simple in theory, but in practice you still need to implement this. This is where consensus protocols come in. So, um, most of them, you may have heard of things like Paxos Raft, there's uh, variations of Paxos, Flexible Paxos, um, there's CAS Paxos, which is quite recent, and most of them, except for CAS Paxos, have a log and a leader election mechanisms. These are things that are not trivial to understand. I mean, Lampert talked about Paxos, and then two years later came with, he was coordinated at a, at a conference, and people told him it's too complicated, so he, he published Paxos Made Simple. And then uh, the 10 years later, Raft came out, which had the design goal of being uh, in search of an understandable consensus algorithm because Paxos was not understandable enough. And even Raft is sometimes misunderstood and wrongly implemented. So it's not, we're not done yet. This is hard stuff, but it's also very important because if you want a strong consistency, want these kind of guarantees, this is what you have to co come up with. <coughs> On the other end of the spectrum, very interesting research, conflict-free replicated data types. They say, well, we're not going to be strongly consistent, but we, we are going to be eventually consistent, but strongly so, which is to say, we know we're going to reach consensus. When the network is back, we're going to reach consensus. So there is two of these, uh, two families, one that uses commutativity of operations, like plus is a commutative operation, one plus two is equals two plus one, but it's, uh, and then the other one uses convergence of state. So these data structures have a merge function. It's based on semi-lattices. Um, here, a quick example. We have three nodes. Each of the nodes, they start at zero. On node one, we set the value to one. On node two, we set it to four. Then as we spread things around and we use the max function between two things, um, 
here the maximum between 0 and 4 is 4, so the result is 4. Then when it receives 1 from the first node, the max between 4 and 1 is still 4, so we end up with 4. The same we repeat here on the, on the second node, well, max between whatever and 4 is 4 in this example. At the end of the day, everybody has 4 as a result. It's something that's known to converge. It's mathematically proven and sound to be converged. It's quite cool and um, CRDTs are also available or are also at the foundation of ACA Cluster's um, membership consensus. And then my preferred way of reaching consensus is by convention, by not talking at all. So ACA Cluster doesn't have leader election, it has leader designation. It takes all the member IP addresses and sorts them and puts the ones that are in a state that are not fit to be leader at the very bottom and then the first one is the leader. So the nodes don't even need to talk to one another, they just know, okay, this is the leader, that's it, no, no need to talk, that's, that's quite elegant. So <coughs> in practice, ACA cluster, I'm going to speed up a bit because I'm running out of time. Uh, in terms of architecture, at the bottom we have membership, which is uh, giving you who is there and who is not, and then on top of that you have CRDTs with distributed data, you have a cluster singleton, which in ensures that there's only one of them in the cluster, and you have sharding. These are all the things that are provided and on top of which you can build your application with ACA Cluster. Now, um, ACA Cluster uses uh, the fee accrual failure detection with a ping pong strategy. It uh, uses random biased gossip. So as I said, this is random gossip, but we bias towards the nodes that haven't seen the gossip yet. And then in terms of consensus, the leader is reached by convention and the leader is also driving membership decisions. And so when, the, when there is a failed node, so long as there is a failed node, the leader is not going to let any, anyone in or out of the cluster because of the result we said in the beginning. So if we look at this, if you have an ACA cluster, you start with wanting to join the cluster, then the leader says yes, and then you're up, then you leave, you're leaving, and then you go down, and at the end you're removed, that's nice, but in reality that's not what happens, and what happens is you go up and then you crash. <laughs> and then the failure detector says, well, now you're in this pseudo strange state where you're unreachable. Then you go down and you're removed. And the big question, of course, is how do we get here? Because that's not the failure detector that makes a decision. It's not the leader that makes a decision. Who makes a decision? So you could sit next to your cluster and watch it and make it manually, but that's not quite nice. So this is a class of algorithms called split brain resolvers. Okay? This is where split brain resolvers come in. If you heard that, network partition split brain resolution algorithms, that's where they live. And then to finish, what I just wanted to add is, um, we make all these, we have all these nice technologies, Akka, Cluster, Cassandra, Kafka, Console, the list goes on and on. We deploy those on physical servers. Okay, and of course, you know, we collocate an ACA cluster node with a Cassandra cluster node because we need persistence, we want locality, etc. So we have all these physical machines and they all have this cluster, the same thing. They, and they all want to answer the same question, who is there? Everybody just talks to one another and they all go across the wire and everybody just wants to know the same thing. Are you here? Are you not? But everybody sends these things around. And so if you look at this now, this is uh, temperature anomalies by country since 1880. So we're still fine here in the 1920s, 1930s. Ah, it's a bit, it's get a bit different. And then at some point we're going to start introducing computers and, um, you know, a bit more than, than, you know, Paxos gets invented at the end of the century. Uh, and then Raft. And that's now, and we're pretty much doomed, people. Uh, I'm not putting the blame on the consensus protocols, but um, also you could draw, a yeah. Um, but but um, my point here is to say, why do we have so many arrows? Can't we just, you know, federate this, have this as a sort of baseline service in computers like DNS or, <coughs> or another one? All right. I think I'm through for two. I'm running out of time, really. Uh, if you want to read more about this stuff, I blog at, on my website, uh, lots of articles on ACA cluster, uh, etc. These are the papers that have been maltreated for this talk. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much.
which says that <coughs> you basically, I'm paraphrasing, but it says that you should not really use it in production unless you're getting like commercial light band split brain. And resolver, yes, well. Yes. Can you please maybe hint that is there a way to use it in production without actually getting that? So there are a few, uh, I reviewed them recently for a client. I did review all the open source split brain resolvers. I also wrote one on my own, which works, which I know to work, but it's not open source. Uh, <laughs> and it's not even to sell, for sale. Um, there's one of them, uh, I forgot the name, it's one of the Japanese uh, guys did a split brain resolver, which works in, not totally, but partly for the thing where you have a static quorum. Uh, it's still wrong in the way it's implemented because it shuts down the node instead of letting the user, the system shut down gracefully. But that's the closest to what you have to a functional thing. Um, but yeah, that's a big gap. I mean it's kind of silly because then you use like a cluster and then you notice that you need that. Yeah. If you could block a bug, that would be... Yeah, it's, it's one of the things I want to talk about, yes, definitely. <coughs> Hi, uh, thank you for, for the talk. Um, I'm I'm putting uh, Lagom in production, yeah. uh, so I have five applications. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really small uh, number of allocations on top mm -hmm. of uh, console. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so Lagom is using singletons, yes. uh, so it relies on Aka cluster. Yeah. Do you know anyone who, who tried to, f I mean, it's really the, the difficult part about uh, putting Lagom in production is maintaining uh, Lago, uh, Aka clusters. Yeah. Is there ways to uh, not using Aka cluster with Lagom? No, no, because Lagom is built on top of Aka cluster and play, etc. So it's not something you can switch out. Uh, but you wouldn't, I mean, Aka cluster is by far the most honest technology out there in terms of uh, operating it, because the others go like, this is magic, it will just work, trust us. And then it breaks and you don't even know why. At least with Aka Cluster, you know why it breaks. You know the guarantees that they're doing and the documentations are very, very explicit about these are the guarantees. And the only thing is as to, to operate it, it's not, it's not that bad. If you now, uh, if, you, if Kubernetes support is getting better day by day, yeah. um, if you don't like Kubernetes, which I don't like either, if you have a small cluster, I th uh, you know, you just drop a jar there and you just... But for example, if you use a console with a DNS discovery, yes. Uh, so the, the whole point is like, I have a node which is unreachable. Yeah. Uh, so what you said is that you need to wait before killing it. Well, okay, but, but that's because the failure detector of Akka will know that, but if you don't have a split brain resolver, the downing is to done by hand. So that's yeah. the first question. <laughs> Very nice, I forget this every time. Yes. Why on earth isn't this open source? Um, you need a split brain resolver, static Chrome can help you there. I mean, if, you, if you have this, this I, I forgot the, the, the name of the implementer. It's not the most maintained piece of software out there, but it's correct at least. The first strategy is correct. Uh, okay. That's what you, what you need there. Because uh, it's not that it's there is a delay, it's just that by default, if you deploy like a cluster and you don't specify a downing resolver, the thing will stay up and the leader won't be able to make decisions and then you can't change the membership topology anymore. And that's, that's what happens there. So you need a split brain resolver, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah? What happens, so if you're in, in the case of Aka cluster, let's say, thanks. What happens in the case of Aka cluster? Well, you said that there's um, a convention that the uh, leader is always the lowest sorted uh, node. What is happens if that one is unreachable, as determined by everyone else? Well, if, if, that, if the leader becomes unreachable, um, the failure detector on each node will see that node as being in a status that is not fit anymore. It's not up. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be a pseudo state. Um, well, it's it's going to basically kick it out of that ordering. It will put it at the bottom, and then it's not going to be the leader anymore. So the old leader is going to jump. There's an extremely nice demo, and I'm hope that hoping that next year we'll come here. I'll we'll have a few racks of Raspberry Pi clusters. We, we're producing these, going to produce the, these now. So these are Raspberry Pis with LEDs on them, LED stripes, where you see each LED represents one node. And as you unplug the cables, you can see the leader literally jumping from one node to the next. So you see, you basically really see that the leader changes the, the moment you unplug the cable. Um, these little Raspberry Pi Aka clusters will be available for sale in not too long, hopefully. I'm working on this with a few people from Lightband, 
uh, and it's, um, it's going to be a great way to demo that sort of behavior. Uh, what is your experience when, for instance, the shard coordinator is migrated because it's unavailable? Yes. Um, when you uh, look at ACA, then actually buffer is buffering is taking place until the new uh, coordinator is selected. Yeah. When you have uh, systems with a tremendous amount of volumes, what is your experience there? Yeah, that's the bottleneck. Okay, so if you have a large volume, so that's one of the design issues with, sh uh, with sharding and ACA cluster is... Um, although that has gotten better when they switch to CRDTs as a way to replicate clusters, uh, shard state. It used to be persistence, now it's CRDTs based. Um, when you have a large, large volume, clearly the rebalancing can take a long time. And I, I don't have a good solution there. Is that's just a design reality. So I would say that if you can, for some entities that are time sensitive in that regard, look into distributed data, look into CRDTs. They are uh, harder to work with, but they can still be extremely powerful because then the latency on these data structures is like really small. Uh, and they're making progress. They have Delta CRDTs now as of already for some time, 2512 or something, or earlier on. Um, so, so this is how I would uh, deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> hmm? Okay, thank you. If you have more questions, just come see me.